This episode of the Wedding Film School Show is brought to you by Musicbed, the best music licensing platform for wedding filmmakers. Head over to themusicbed.com and enter our code WFS on checkout to get a free month on your annual wedding subscription. Now, on to the show. Is, is our industry structured in such a way that anyone can retire? So the question really is, is there long-term security as a wedding filmmaker? The second you stop producing the volume, you're not making any money ever again. Yep, you're hustling for your next dinner. But eventually, what happens when you you know get that injury? What happens when uh, you simply aren't as good? There's so many other factors besides your health that might make you unable to sell weddings, even when you could still shoot them. When we have an industry that doesn't allow for people with different skills, because they can't jump through every hoop, they just can't jump through any hoops. You're just thinking the wrong way. like. You can't have a conspiracy where you get every single person to agree to not do a wedding film for less than X dollars. There's always going to be a need for a lower cost option in any market. I'm going to get right in my bag. Uh, why you going to try to get mad? Uh, everybody want to keep up. Uh, don't you know I'm too fast? Uh, I'm going to zip, zip right past. Uh, drip, drip all of my swag. Uh, all right, hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Wedding Film School Show. My name is Jared, and today we have uh, another topic where we're kind of just going off the cuff. Yes. Uh, I think it's going to be a good topic, um, but it's the the topic that a lot of, uh, I think, wedding filmmakers in general kind of have in the back of their head. It's kind of like they don't want to touch it because it's a little bit uh, causes a sense of dread in their head because there's not really a good answer. Yes. So today we are here to talk a little bit about um, what some possible answers could be. Uh, so Jay, what, what are we kind of uh, getting into? I would today? say like, it's more than more than anything. It's kind of like, really, job security, and life after weddings, but it's not exclusively any of those things. It's kind of like this idea of like, you know, it started when you were kind of bringing up like, basically, all these booking agencies that you don't like. And, and, and you were like, let's talk about this. And I was like, well, the problem is I know a lot of people who need those jobs. Mm. Right. Like, like, so it's like, why do they need those jobs? Well, because the, the industry is structured in some ways that they, if you cannot just book all your own weddings, but you're still a good shooter and you mm. want to do it, there's no other alternatives. Right for their skills to make money and they need a living. And then it kind of just pushed us into this whole like, what do they what do they do when that runs, when weddings are gone? Right. Right, like is, is our industry structured in such a way that anyone can retire? Right. Right? So but, the question really is, is there long-term security as a wedding filmmaker? Yeah. Because how many wedding filmmakers do we know that are above the age of And we mean like financial 40? security too, like not, not like, is what does longevity look like shooting weddings? Which is a kind of a different question. It's like, because it, it's like, what about even when the weddings are done? Right. Yeah. It's like, but it it's ties like, in. I it think does, it all ties. It does ties tie in. in. It does tie in. So, how how many wedding filmmakers would you say are above the age of forty that you know? That I know a lot, yeah. but that are in the industry, um, like average. Yeah. You know. And, I, and we were talking before, it's like, it's kind of hard for me to say the median age of the industry because there are some OG camcorder warriors that are still out there. And maybe they're not crushing on Craigslist, yeah, crushing yeah. Facebook they're marketplace. Just, like, like, they, 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 they established themselves in that first wave of wedding filmmaking and they, they, they adapted. They're still in the industry. Um, they still don't edit in a, in a nonlinear editing platform. Well, they might. <laughs> Who knows? But but I think like still in, deliver on tape. <laughs> in general, I think it's a young man's game. Yeah. I I think like there's probably I don't know less than ten percent of the people doing it. Right. This is me just literally making it up, like based on the people I interact with. Yeah. You know. I don't know. Like it's tough because I feel like there's like always like this sweet spot of age. It's like people get into wedding filmmaking from like thirty to. 35 and they usually don't make it past that yeah it's like they're like either like i did this one job and it sucked and so now i want to try something else and i'm going to try wedding filmmaking right that seems to be a lot of people's journey yeah you know i, I think um there's kind of a different uh different tiers of like people that phase out right 
you have your initial person who gets into it and is just like, yeah, I did a couple of wedding films. Like I'm into it. I'm into cameras. I like to have gear and I filmed a couple of weddings and experienced it and it just wasn't for me. And then you have other people who are really trying to create a business and it's just like they try it for a couple of years, two, three years. And they're like, this is really hard to make an actual living. Uh, maybe they get a job doing something else and then eventually their grown up job takes over. Right. So that's another kind of tier person. You have another person who made it, uh, who's like pulling in, you know, that golden 30 weddings, making 120 K a year, let's just say as an example. Um, but I think for that person, a lot of times you hit this glass ceiling of like, okay, now I'm 40 years old. Uh, can I keep doing this? Um, cause generally like we probably know maybe maybe like five percent of the industry and i think that's being generous goes past age 40. like there aren't that many older wedding filmmakers out there that are relevant that can still you know edit um and and whenever they are out there they're completely the industry leaders right well and 40 is even young like it is young like, it is young in general but for a wedding filmmaker Someone would look at that and be like, those people are ancient. That this person's is Ray Roman. Well, right? yeah. And so the real question is how many 55-year-old wedding filmmakers do you know? Because most people sure. are retiring by the time they're like in their 50s. Most people are retiring in their 60s. Sure. That's the real question. Yeah. It's like you need, in your retirement age, you need those last 10 years of employment to really round out anything you're going to do after in your golden years. And, yeah. And so like this idea of like, is really the question we're actually asking is, is wedding filmmaking actually a legitimate career option for people? Right. Because a career is something that you, that gives you security after the career. That is really how you should be defining a career. Like, like that's why people call them starving artists. It's not a compliment. It's like, it's like, Oh, I sell paintings. Okay. Um, that's great. You sell paintings. How many do you sell? Oh, I sell 10 paintings you know, overpriced paintings for $10,000 each. Um, okay, paint another one. Like, that's it. It's like, you just, you pretty much are running a service-based industry and as uh, the second you stop producing the volume, you're not making any money ever again. Yep, you're hustling for your next dinner. Every time, it's yep. sing for your supper until you die. And I think like, wedding filmmaking is an art form that that's really challenging to do. Like you could, conceivably hit your make your best paintings when you're 70 right and you might still love it and that's great like it's a viable option to paint till you die it could be a viable option to shoot wedding films till you die i don't want to like if you're listening to this and you're like i'm 60 years old you're saying i'm not relevant no i'm not saying that yeah i'm just saying like literally like, you could hit 60 and physically be unable to do the what you used to be able to do yep Yep. I, I think a, a, the right way to kind of frame this conversation is what is a sustainable model for yeah. creating a wedding film company? Um, or how are you preparing your exit strategy? Mm -hmm. And like, what is the industry able to do for you? Like, what is this model of the industry mm -hmm. that that is is the industry hostile to actually creating what it needs to create yeah. to give people these opportunities. Right. So we're kind of operating on a principle of like the wedding industry is it, when it comes to wedding filmmakers is a pretty immature field, yes. right? It's an immature career if you could, right? If you're comparing it to other self-operated type businesses like a plumber or an electrician that maybe works for themselves or uh, even somebody that works in the hospitality world is a waiter or a bartender or whatever. Um, there are models for that that mm -hmm. well, allow yeah. for longer term. Well, the industry has, by being part of one part of the industry, you can naturally be part of another part. Like you can transition in and out of roles because the industry is mature. Right. It has a, like a infrastructure. Yeah. And like a almost like a chain of command. It has a, like a natural progression and yep. flow. If You're, you want to hire staff, you can be like, I'm looking for a wedding film editor, right? Mm -hmm. well, how many wedding film editors do you know that don't well, also even more shoot? So, <laughs> how many studio managers do you know? Right. Like right. people who like, 
versus like how many people you know that are managers at restaurants. Yes. And then owners of multiple restaurants. Yes. And then like, oh, there's literally people who just invest in restaurants. Like there's so many, it's such a mature industry and in our industry, like the average business is pretty much, hi, I'm a wedding filmmaker and I literally am the sales department, I'm the editor, I'm the shooter, I'm literally every single part of my wedding business. There's no margin to hire anyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually have been trained that it's bad to hire anyone else yeah. and I never will hire anyone else. There's a stigma to it, uh -huh. uh, yes. a, a wrong stigma, we think. Right? Yes, and I then my so my plan is to make 120K for the next 20 years. It's like, that's great. So you have $2 million during your entire earning potential of your adult life. That's de better than many, for sure. But it's certainly not, if you don't play your cards right, it's not like you can just retire, mm -hmm. stop doing it. Like, yeah. you, like, or and you definitely can't get hurt. Right. Like, or something like that, which, believe it or not, people get hurt a lot doing this industry. Like, yeah. I could yeah. go out and hurt myself any weekend. Yep. Shooting yep. wedding films. We all know photographers, wedding filmmakers that, you know, all of a sudden have had like knee issues or back issues. I know a guy like, who had to retire because they, of his ears. Yeah. They can't do the work anymore. And that's, that's some industries, but I think in some industries you can move roles, right? Sure. It's like I used to be the cook and now I'm more, I'm, I'm a manager where I can sit in the office. Well, and, baseball and is a good example, like, right? Sure. Like people play baseball and then they, you know, they might hit the top of the industry, right? And become right. a major league or maybe they don't. Yep. And maybe they become a high school coach if they don't hit the top. Maybe they become a major league baseball player like Justin Verlander. Yep. Justin Verlander can become a broadcaster. He can be he could work in any front office he wanted to. He could become a coach yep. and a professional like our industry or a sportscaster or a scout or whatever. Pretty it, much whatever he wants to do yeah. because he's around all those things and it's got an infrastructure. Yeah. And so why does it have the infrastructure? That's the question. It's because they hire people. They have jobs. Mm -hmm. Like you, if, you, if you're an industry that hires no one, you're an industry that has nothing for people to do. Right. And like we hire no one. Like, oh, I have an editor. Yeah, you have this con, you're, you have an overseas person, which I'm not saying is anything wrong with that, but like that you're paying, would you, like the real question you have to ask yourself as an industry is, would you pay someone else what you would want to make to m edit a wedding? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is heck no, <laughs> you might have a problem as an industry. But yeah. And I, like my thing with price is that's why I think we should be raising our prices. It's not because of the value of what I'm doing. I'm so it's like, no, it's the cost of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The cost of what you're doing is what should be part of what informs your pricing. Yeah. Especially when there are plenty of willing people to pay what you're willing to charge as you're raising prices. There are like, so, um, yeah, I, I think the baseball's, um, kind of comparison I think is really interesting. Um, because it's very true. Like it's, it's relevant in that baseball players and play until they're like 35. Yeah. The we're all players right now, like right? 40. Like we're all playing the game right now. We're learning, we're growing, we're increasing our stats. Right. Um, but eventually what happens when you, you know, get that injury, what happens when, uh, you simply aren't as good as the younger guys coming up or you and they can't replace speak you. The, like you can't speak the visual language or the yeah. storytelling or, or just speak to 20 year old brides like it, it, there's a, a you can't relate to them anymore there comes a place where no one accidentally gets naked in front of you anymore <laughs> yeah, they're like this just creepy old dude he's 40 and you're like oh, that's me now like yeah <laughs> you know and neither of us are 40 yet i'll We're... be 40 in like a few days oh yeah 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 yeah. that's right that's right so this is a very good conversation yes. to have so we can talk a lot of smack about 40 year olds yes uh, <laughs> still um but yeah I, I think it's um i think the comparison is really good um and and it just kind of begs the question of like what are some ways that you think wedding filmmakers can create a business that has a long longer term mm -hmm. longevity yeah, in like, the industry and it's not all the macro stuff like like one wedding filmmaker can't make everyone hire editors or create 
Right. Studio. Like, do you have to have a studio? You have to get your own thing together, and like a lot of people need to get their own thing yeah. together, and then it will create more opportunities, and it'll be better for the next generation of right. filmmakers. But I think like there's a couple ways you can go because I, I think at the end of the day, first of all, it doesn't matter if you stay in weddings. Mm-hmm. Just you know, you got to just retire and have some money. Yep. And you got to you know, hopefully you enjoy what you're doing. Most people are not going to make it to this point, which is. They have a 20-year career in their industry. They do really, really well for themselves. And at that point, they're just done working. Right. I don't think most people are going to make it to retirement in wedding filmmaking. Right. Um, how, yeah. how old is Ray? Like, uh, I don't even want to guess because he'll roast us if we're Ray's wrong. Ray's in his 50s. Is he a 50? Okay. Yeah. Ray, I thought you were 40, too. Yeah. He's got to be uh, low low 50s. But he's been doing it for a really long time. He might be time. 49, but... but and he's I still think working. He's... And he charges a lot more than you or I ever will. But, <laughs> right? but Ray has, like, one of the most reputable brands. Right. But he's still working. He has to still work. He hasn't gotten to a point Freaking where he's, had, he's been athlete. able to retire. Yeah. So I think, like, he's one of the few people who maybe could work as long as he's working. Sure. He probably maybe could retire with what he's charging, but um, he is probably like you and I where he just likes money. It's not just even about the money. It's like he's still getting booked. Right. He's still working. Right. He can work. Most people won't even make it past the first year of their business. Yeah. So I think, you know, like there's the people who work until they retire. Then there's the people who shoot for a period, like we'll say like five to ten years do pretty well for themselves, but then they're just done. They just, they're done with weddings. They get burnt out or they're just have more opportunities and they're moving on and like they're moving into another industry or into commercial work. And I think that's a pretty good plan. That's a pretty good path for people. It's not as easy as people think. Cause I think commercial filmmaking is not a one-to-one switch, right? Like it's just because you're, it's not about the cameras. It's about like, there's it's an lot. entire different culture, like, and and also I would say the same thing with commercial work, where commercial work is also a young man's game. Like, if you're thinking like, oh, I'm gonna get to 40 and then start my career in the commercial world, it's like gonna you're make... gonna have to start as a PA and work. You're starting over in a lot of ways, unless you know you unless can you start get your, your own clients. Thing. You start, but then you're still starting your own studio, mm-hmm. doing that, like. Uh, or, or, or maybe you're shooting, you're sending it out, like, but you're still having to come up with some kind of uh, business or brand. Well, yeah, and for sure, it's like the that's hard. A lot of people won't be able to do it. Yeah, and so that's why I'm always like, when people are like, I want to get into commercial, I'm like, good luck trying to do that. Like, and if you think, it, like, if you think there's a lot of like bottom feeders in the wedding world and a lot of competition in the wedding world. Wait till you get into the commercial world because it is way more cutthroat. Well, and also just like so inefficient. Like, right. I, you know, I've we, I've had gigs that are ten thousand dollar gigs that the person takes freaking hundred days to pay me. Right. And right. like I have this other job. I'm you have way more autonomy. Quoting right now, and it's like yeah. taking four months to get the quote even done with the person because they can't even. It's like make decisions. Uh, you're such not a, talking to the decision yeah, maker. It's, not, it's like it's not like everything it's cracked up to yeah. be. And with, like, with wedding filmmaking, you sell a product, right? It's like yeah. this is what I'm selling to. you. That's what I love about wedding filmmaking is like, mm-hmm. hey, this is what I'm going to give you. You're going to buy it, and I'm going to do it my way. And you want my product. Yes. With the commercial world, it's much more of like. Well, this is what we want you to make. Well, and this and is what we not... need for our website. And like, right. I, I just, it needs, this is what we need. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the point of this is not to trash the commercial world. No, it's, it's great. just to talk about, you know, the pros and cons. Like, and, and, and to really kind of help people just think through, like, what are the good things about the wedding industry? What are some things that maybe you have to think about when you're developing? Well, if you want to move into commercial, you better start now. That's what I'm saying. Sure, it's like you yep. need to do them concurrently. Yep, it, it, like it's really all I'm saying. Yep, yep. And, and a lot of people. So that's one thing. They move into commercial, or maybe they just move into a totally different industry. Yeah, like, they start working in healthcare or have insurance, in- or yes, who knows, whatever, R- whatever real estate, something they're interested in ah. that maybe they can use their video skills, or they maybe just work for a company doing video. Yep. My guess would be that's probably the least, but some people do that. Yeah. Well, and, and that's even hard because, like we were talking about, there's plenty of outsourcers out there. Mm-hmm. So it's like if you just want to work for someone else editing someone's video, it's like 
why is someone going to pay you what you're charging your rates at when they could just have someone else who's just as good in you know overseas doing that so it's tough and i think the the easiest people are just part-time people like that's the easiest yeah if you're just doing this part-time like great to pay for your snowmobiling habit or whatever if you're (laughs) doing this part-time and you have another job this could be your retirement right right well that that's why wedding filmmaking and and really the wedding world works so well for part-time people right they're just weekend warriors like hey i have my job it pays me you know six figures can you imagine if you were like making like shooting like 20 weddings a year and you have a full-time job and you're making even if you're just making 60k yeah. but all of it was going into your retirement yeah for 20 years yeah yeah oh you just crush like that's it's a great retirement plan yeah <laughs> <laughs> um but but that just there's a what we're trying to say is there's a lot of things working against our industry maturing it's not anyone's problem it's not be, we're not trying to say like oh it's your fault for not running a studio that the entire industry isn't or it's mature. Just educators' fault for there's, training you a certain way. Or... There's so many things working against our industry moving forward and maturing, um, and and just a lot of forces right now. Like that that you know uh, we consider. I don't think it's a lost cause necessarily, um, but uh, yeah. So so talk about maybe uh, should we talk about maybe what we do in our yeah yeah it could be business? interesting. So yeah. like we. We think it's interesting, at so least. So we have a studio. Right. Right? In, in, in like, but, like, a lot of people have a studio. Yeah. Right? So I think, like, the difference with our studio is we have employees. We don't just have contractors, which I know plenty of students have employees. And we also have contractors. We also have contractors, but we pick and choose based on what's best. Roles and, yeah. And we also pay ourselves a salary that's a fixed salary. Jared and I, we don't just take our money and and put it in our hands. We give ourselves bonuses because we own the business, yep. and so, but but we pay ourselves a salary, and we also use our business to invest in a couple of retirement things that we do with a with a financial advisor. Yeah, and so the 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 business runs with margin, right? And I think that's like the the, the mindset shift that does need to happen for people is like. You are running a thing that costs money. The business is in itself a entity. That it's not just like, oh, I made this money. It's the business made this money. Right. And then I pay myself. Right. Even if you pay yourself just a percentage in your salary, but my my encouragement to most people is to pay yourself a fixed salary and then do bonuses. Based on profit. Mostly. Based on how you're doing, but yep. live on your salary. Sure. Live on your salary and your saving and your retirement. So like your business is like there's cost to run the business. So like say you have a – you always hire a $400 second shooter for every wedding. Okay, every time you book a wedding, you knock 400 bucks off right there. And then you have a base salary of $70,000, $80,000, whatever you want to pay yourself, $100,000. Maybe that's your base salary. Okay, you need to book 25 weddings. A certain percentage of those weddings immediately goes into your salary. Everything that's left over, that's your profit or that's your investment in your next thing. But it's like that's how we run our business. Right. Is is like first of all, we don't need to be at the weddings. We have a studio, which means I don't need to be there. Yep. Second of all, I have a salary and I have a 403b, which is a retirement like a 401k or whatever. And so I'm, the business is pouring into my own retirement. And so I have a fixed income and then we have bonus income based on how things go, right? We're doing distributions because we're an S corp. So that's how we run our business. We have an S corp and we do, we pay ourselves in predictable ways that, and we budget extra money so that way we don't have to do everything. And so we're not paying ourselves as much as a lot of other people are making with their business. I think people would... Like, we made over a million dollars last year, gross, as a business. Individually. We, individually. In our, in our pockets. In our pockets. Yeah. We in, took, our, in our, in our uh, uh, vaults, like Donald Duck's vault. If, <laughs> yes. If we told you how little we made out of that, you would probably not be interested in running the business that we run. Yeah. Some of you make more money than us. 
few of you today yeah today you make more money than us yes but i i don't think a lot of you are going to make the same amount of money in 30 years Mm -hmm. and i think i will yeah (laughs) and i think that's what we're talking about right? right is like are you setting yourselves up to live the life that you want in 20 years not just today right right exactly like that that's kind of and we started our business together always kind of thinking that we were going to run a studio i don't really know why we made that decision i it probably started with our name when we decided like, well because we weren't going to name our, our our studio j and j productions but uh and then we we're just like you know what we should bring more people on to just help and and i think like, we came from like a framework of team from like team com- education production like, environments we yes. were in and so like we didn't start with weddings we started with commercial yeah and production and that was our framework and so we came from an industry framework that was team friendly and studio and came from a world that was much more sustainable and so we're just like well this is how you need to structure this is what a business is (laughs) yeah if we want to be successful long term this is what we have to build we didn't know anything about and wedding filmmaking wasn't like mature and so we didn't really have anything to compare it to yeah yeah so well i think we were just like well we want to do this for as long of a time a period as possible so this is what we're going to do and um honestly i think for us we were like no one else (laughs) there wasn't a model yeah. for us. Um, but I would also say the good thing about the business that we've learned about is it does kind of make for a more sustainable uh, type of industry. Yeah. I don't want people to think we're like master planning it. Yeah. Like, no, we, we didn't know what we were doing, but like we kind of lucked into a yeah. better, like a good business model. But it does provide that sustainability of like, we have employees that are working with us that are like, like Kyle, for a long time was just editing Monday through Friday, uh, you know, nine to five. And it allowed him to become, in my opinion, probably one of the best wedding film editors in the entire world. Like he's a great editor. He might like, I don't know. I know a lot of editors who are really great, but in terms of the amount that he cranks out at the quality he cranks out, like he is one of the most professional, like talented people, definitely in the country. Like, and he started right here, like five years ago editing full-time you know um that is a job that is a real job that is possible that you know if more people ran studios like ours i don't want to toot our horn too much because uh, there are a lot of ways to do it but this is just a way that is a, a very sustainable way um i think we would both agree that not everyone can run a studio or wants to run a studio or should run a studio the way that we do uh but it i think this kind of model does make more it a people bit more definitely should because it would it would like the guys I mentioned at the beginning who are like, well, I need the money from working with, uh, right. I don't know, one of those terrible companies that everyone hates. Yeah, those booking agencies that we won't mention. <laughs> we uh, probably like, have mentioned. Oh, I shoot with before. George Street, like, yeah. and I need that income. I shoot like twenty times a year with George Street and another yep. fifteen times a year for myself. Yep. There's a lot of people like that who maybe would be better off shooting 50 weddings a year and not editing anything. Yep. And not right. booking anything because they just, they're not that good at it and, but they're good at shooting and, and that's all they actually really are interested in. And wouldn't that be cool if more people could do that? Yeah. Just yeah. like, wouldn't it be cool if more people could book 220 weddings yeah. and not have to shoot them? Yeah. And I, and I would say more kind of uh, role pos- based positions Um, like, Hey, I just want to second shoot for weddings. I want to be a professional second shooter. Like that is a job option. And then you could, you know, maybe fill up your week with commercial work and kind of split it 50, 50. Like if there are more people like that, then people like us who want to run a studio could be like, Hey, I'm going to give you 20 weddings. Here are the ones that they are. They're like, great. Let's line me up. You look at commercial. Like I know of several places I can go hire anyone I need to hire. Yeah. The, the problem is every, when everyone is trying to run their own show, they will never line themselves up as like, well, I want second shooter gigs. They'll be like, no, I'm going to keep myself open so I can book all my own weddings, which is like. Or I'm not a second shooter. I'm a lead shooter. Right. That's and, who I and, am. I'm, de- I'm decreasing right. my brand. It's, it's a little bit of ego instead of just being like, hey, I'm going to get paid. And I'm going to get paid long term. I actually think the biggest issue with our industry, Jared, is that no one budgets for anything but their salary. 
like the average person making money is taking all the money. Yeah. And so when they need help, they have to get the cheapest possible help. Yeah. Which means overseas, like for editing on or shooting, it's like a Craigslist thing. And like every, I will say this: some people are bet- budgeting for their shooting because like we all love shooting. We, like shooting, that's the valuable thing. Yeah. It's like you're gonna pay so I would only pay eight hundred dollars a day for. Like all the people run their mouth about shooting and how much they pay their second shooters. I'm like, okay, you're, so your business sucks is what you're telling me? <laughs> That's great. But um, so you're paying someone $1,100 to second shoot? Yeah, because I value them. Okay, that's great. Um, and how much do you charge? Oh, 5000 5, You paid 25% of your money? And it's like they're not thinking about it right, right? Because there's no – like it's not like they, they, they think, oh, I'm only – my only cost to running my business is – paying for the second shooter it's like right so you have no gear you don't you don't have to replace your gear you don't do pay for any marketing no but what also do you, p- do you know how much a, a, a camera op is making in los angeles right now not eleven hundred not eleven hundred dollars a day in in most cases sometimes the thing about a gucci job but these business people they're not business people so they think that the skill that they're doing is the valuable thing that is not the valuable thing. There's a reason why in the corporate world, the people who make all the money are the salespeople. Fair. Because, and the business owner. So it's an issue of sales and liability. Yeah. You sell the thing and you're liable for the thing. That's the big money. They, and you, they're absorbing all the additional costs, the insurance costs. They're not running their business in a smart way. Mm-hmm. And they're definitely not putting a budget. And this is why I say all this. They're definitely not budgeting for them to be able to take a back seat in their business, which means you need to have a, everything in your business you need to be replacing yourself with. Mm-hmm. And then they're definitely not investing in their retirement. Mm-hmm. And those are the two things that kill our industry. Yep. It's like people don't budget for replacing themselves and they don't budget for anything past wedding filmmaking. Yep. They just think like, I'm going to make more and I'm going to make more and I'm going to make more. And that's everyone's business plan is how do I charge $10,000? Yep. It's like, yep. what if you never charge 10000 What if you only charge 5000 Yeah, it's a, they think it's an endless staircase. But then it's like when you look around, like we were saying uh, at the beginning, it's just like there's a drop-off eventually where you just will not get hired anymore we're for whatever all, reason. We're all barreling towards this cliff yeah. of no longer being relevant or no longer being able. Yeah. One For one, like there's going to be something that takes you out of the wedding filmmaking yep. game. Or someone it's, that eats your lunch. It's not right? like being oil baron. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like, like we should get into that industry and all be oh, oil yeah. barons. Yeah, that'd be smart. Yeah. So I, I, I think, you know, what we're talking about is like ways to think about like either your exit strategy or, you know, how you're actually going to create a business model that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Why don't and, we dig and, into that the, a little? Well, we, we talked a little bit about like, exit strategies from the wedding industry a little bit we said did i say savings you, you should no. save yeah like uh, that's i think for most people the ideal exit strategy is make a ton of money become that ten thousand yep. dollar twenty thousand dollar wedding filmmaker and actually budget to save yep yep you know that that is a lot that's a relevant journey you shoot you shoot until you're done then you you're done working and you live off the money you made as a shooter yep and a, and a wedding filmmaker at the same time, we're kind of talking about a lot of wedding filmmakers who probably don't even make enough money in their 10-year career, 15-year career even, to be able to save that much, to be able to live on, like retire at 40. Like that's a lot of money that they need. That That's 25 years that they have to save for. Making yeah, like that, I would say like if you can make hard. it, to, if you can get to 50 in wedding filmmaking, you've like right way past, like you've really well, like a 30-year career in this is like, incredible (laughs) close to unheard of uh i know there are a few yeah but i I would say i would pair this with savings is investing and finding um ways that you can spend your money building other streams of income Mm -hmm. you know uh i think real estate uh is is a way that which also is back into not spending all your money yeah, no, no, not spending all your money, investing your yeah, money yeah. in things, um, starting another business that that makes money in and of itself. I think real estate is a really solid way to do that. Uh, Dax is a guy who's seen a lot of success doing that. Like, I think he has like 
five properties now. And so they're wedding filmmaking. Andy's also kind of doing that dual income kind of thing. Um, you could get to the place as a 40 year old where if you have a few properties, you could live off those, the income from those properties eventually after paying mortgages and whatnot. Um, if you do it right, like you can actually do that. That that's a, that's a solid way to do it. Doing Airbnb, uh, whatever it might be. And, and I think this world, um, of, of real estate, there's, um, not a lot of expertise that you have to learn, like in comparison to like going to school, learning. Well, even in comparison to the other thing we were talking about, which is like running a studio, like you have to have a lot of skills to run a studio. Right. Right. Like, like that's one path. Yep. That's the path. You do some real estate. I've done real estate. I don't think I'll be doing that, but it's not for me. Yeah. But, but I will say like having a business and multiple businesses. Yeah that is profitable when I'm not there. And like this is brand building, right? Like I have a brand that is bigger than me mm-hmm. and it doesn't require my physical presence. Like I think planners know me, but the average person who interacts with our business has, has no idea who I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like when yep. I show up, they're not like the owner's here. Yeah. Maybe if we tell them, but in general, like yep. I just show up and they're like, yeah, Jason, like to them, I'm just any stop, go love shooter. Yep. Yep. They don't care. Yeah. So, so we talked about some exit strategies. We're talking a little bit now about ways to succeed in the industry, creating essentially a brand. And you kind of have an interesting take on like what a brand is, which is a little less on the uh, marketing front, which I think a lot of people would, would assume when you say the word brand, it has to deal with like marketing, advertising, et cetera. You always talk about it much more um, as a business in, in, the, in the business sense. So tell me a little bit about what you mean with having like a long-term sustainable brand. Well, a brand is an entity, right? A brand is a, a thing. Yeah. It's not a logo. Right. A brand is like, it's a, and part of that is your reputation and part of that is your visual identity, right? And in like, but some of that, a lot of it is like things that are a little more abstract, like reputation and awareness and all those things. But at the end of the day, it all is really just what do people say about when you when you're not around? Like like and is if the brand is you, okay, that's a legitimate brand. Like you know Ray Roman, even though he has associates now, but like it's called Ray Roman, and and like he's the brand, right? And he's always trained that, by the way. He's like, you're the brand. And that's a lot of people train that in, in wedding creatives, photographers. And so they're like, you're the brand. Um, and there's a lot of positives to that. It's definitely a lot more straightforward, right? But if you're the brand, is that limiting your brand? Mm-hmm. And for Ray, it's not, right? If you're at the top of the industry and like your plan is to make like 300k or 400k like become some uber successful filmmaker maybe that's great maybe like you being the brand is the is the right way to go and you're gonna just be smart with your money and put it aside and work as long as you can and build a nest egg and when you're done you're done that's awesome like that might be what you're able to do but for most people they're not going to be able to do that Mm -hmm. and so if you want to build a studio then you have to build a brand that's bigger than you Right. It has to be like, because it's like, are you building a brand that makes money for you or are you building, are you just doing a service? Are you just rendering a service? Like, like the person I mentioned about the paintings, Mm -hmm. right? So if someone has to make the painting, then they're just rendering a service. But when they can make prints of their painting and just because it's Van Gogh, sell it. Mm -hmm. When they can have t-shirts with a Van Gogh, when they have art exhibits that are Van Gogh, that are three D, like Van Gogh, you're not. No one owns a Van Gogh. Mm-hmm. They own things associated with Van Gogh's brand. Now he p- didn't do a great job establishing that while he was alive, <laughs> but like other people built his brand. Yes. for him. Yeah, but that's a good example of when art becomes a brand, right? Yeah. Where it starts to make money in a self-perpetuating kind of way. Yeah. When like even though the creator isn't the one doing the perpetuation. Yes. Right? And it's like having a studio allows you to have that. Yeah. And to a lesser extent, I think just having a personal brand, but really just being willing to let other people do it for you. Yeah. 
He's really so, worked. So someone who's done this successfully as kind of a self brand and, and someone who has like a, a good personal brand is Ray. How do you think that his brand works in this kind of context as a wedding filmmaker? Well, so like Ray has a couple things going for him. A, he's done it a long time. Sure. He's good. He's able to sell wedding planners based on him, his company, his reputation, yes. all these things, and not necessarily have him be the person on site doing the shooting. Yes, and there's also people who are in the industry who look up to him who might be like, oh, I want to work with that guy. And, yeah. You know, and they're good and they're willing, they're able to probably somewhat do what Ray can do, mm -hmm. you know, so the brand helps in that way. It, it does a lot of things for him that allow him to make more money than he could have made just being – yeah, you know, the average wedding filmmaker doesn't have that many things working for them. Mm -hmm. So I think like building a perpetual, uh, like a self-perpetuating personal brand that allows you to take your hands off. Yeah. Do you think, you know, this is kind of a little bit off topic, but do you think it does limit a person or at least works against a person when they make the name of their studio, their last name or their full name or. I mean, I don't, I don't have experience with that, but it seems like it would. Yeah, me too. I, 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 to me, it seems like it would as well. Um, it just is a hump that we never have had to deal with because we've always had a studio name. Well, and I just like I've always been afraid of that. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've never wanted it to be the thing. Like I've always wanted to have freedom. I never wanted my business. I, I like my goal is not to. I don't want to work at my business. Mm -hmm. I want to own my business. Yep. Yep. All right. And like, <clears throat> I think a lot of people that mentality of like I. I am a wedding filmmaker. I am a shooter. It's like, okay, if, and this is why I was talking earlier about the industry. If you don't even identify as a business owner, wouldn't it, why are you owning a business? Mm -hmm. Why don't you just shoot? Yeah, yeah. Because you can shoot for a long time. You build your contacts up. Like, like th there's so many other factors besides your health that might make you unable to sell weddings, even when you could still shoot them. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's like when we have an industry that doesn't allow for people <clears throat> with different skills to still work, valuable skills that are still the market would still pay money for. But because they can't jump through every hoop, they just can't jump through any hoops. Mm -hmm. And I think that sucks. Like, I, 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 it bums me out that, like, I can't just pay, like, editors $1,200 an edit. Mm -hmm. And yeah. someone can make, like, $70,000, $80,000, like, a very solid living just editing wedding films. Yep. So this is kind of getting into like probably the third different option for staying in the wedding industry, which is mature the industry, right? It's, it's, you know, you can run a studio, you can have a really solid self brand that perpetuates, you know, growth, even when you're not super involved. I would say, I wouldn't say Ray necessarily runs a studio. No, he doesn't run a studio, um, but he has associates. But he has associates and he runs a really strong brand. And he pays editors. This third way is collectively, this isn't something necessarily you can do by yourself, but collectively we can grow the industry by hiring people that have special skills, right? Like I'm an editor. Create a place for people. Be more right. inclusive like, and, and be more strategic. Like, like it's just like a classic American problem. If you're not from America, you're listening to this, um, maybe whatever you're coming from, this isn't your context. Yeah. But in America, it's like, oh, I love, I, I really support like made in America. Okay. Uh, here's this t-shirt. It's made in America. It's $25. <sighs> I'm not gonna buy a $25 t-shirt. Okay. You don't support. Okay, great. Then you're enjoy your, you know, Korean t-shirt. There's nothing wrong with that having something made in Vietnam or China or something, but it, it does mean that like you're outsourcing things that could help grow your local industry wherever you're listening to this if you're in india or wherever like the best thing for everyone is that the, your local economy is improved and your nationalization everything should just be nationalized <laughs> we and need to run it through the state <laughs> yeah <laughs> state run wedding from the yeah. no it's like oh those would be so good yeah <laughs> can you imagine <laughs> if the state of massachusetts made a wedding film company the worst uh, rhode island would be a worse one. Oh yeah Remember the, st <laughs> the yeah the state <laughs> 
<laughs> tourism video for Rhode Island. Oh my God! Uh, yeah, that's so. Yeah. What was the slogan again? So yeah, full context. Rhode Island made a, a tourism video a couple years ago. They, Rhode Island is a uh, Providence. Rhode Island is apparently the creative capital of uh, the United <laughs> States. By the way, so that's, so creative that the they self, went all the way down to New York to get an ad agency. The self-proclaimed to, creative. Capital. Yeah, self-proclaimed, very much so. I would say because they have RISD and and Brown, uh, you know. But anyways, they created this slogan called "Cooler and Warmer." <laughs> Which no one really knows what it means. <laughs> like it's cooler. Like, hey man, this is a really cool place to be. But also, it's cool. It's, it's cool warmer than br- you think. Cool and breezy. But it also can be warmer than. It's you th- warmer than you think. You know. Like what? <laughs> That's like a and the logo point. that they made was like as bad as you can, would imagine it would be. <laughs> it just, uh, I just imagine that it's. A sun with blue waves. Yeah, yeah. But it was like the governor being like, that sounds great. Like This is awesome. The governor like knows tons about branding, clearly. Yeah, yeah. State, so. state run running for making a movie. No, yeah. what I'm really talking about is just like. Which is sad, by the way, before we move on, because uh, the, the park's branding, incredible, right? You know, the United States, like national mm-hmm. parks, beautiful. That Like, where did that go? Well, like, they they. I know a little bit about that. They have national parks have bidding. You can go to these companies and, yeah. and compete for these bids, and they get like really big agencies. They're yeah. huge contracts. But that's what they did in Rhode Island. But it's just the people making the decisions at the top were like, "Yeah, that looks good. <laughs> that looks just just as good as the national parks that that they did back in the '30s." You know, yeah, yeah. Um, it's good. Looks what good to were me. we even talking about before this? <laughs> Branding. Branding. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, but, but but creating an industry. Yeah, you know. yeah. So I think at the end of the day, like the like the idea is like that you that more people can work in the industry mm. and and do things that would provide fixed incomes or reliable incomes and retirement plans and strategies and like there's just more opportunities for people. Yeah. Because a lot of people whose businesses, like if there were more opportunities, a lot of these guys who are like, I tried to run my own thing, I failed, but I'm still a good shooter. Mm-hmm. That doesn't really exist now. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, like there's always like a person who just wants to moonlight for one of these like big boo. And I think that's the other side is Jared and I are just so anti those companies. We want them to be put out of business. Like and these I, booking agencies? Yes. yes. And, and like, you're not gonna. Pu- they're not gonna get put out of business by scolding with time. Yeah, and people are like, oh, everything. We gotta raise the boats. Uh, and I always tell people, it's like, you don't understand business. If you think that the way that we're gonna improve wedding filmmaking is to complain or charge more money, you don't realize that. Like, you're you're just thinking the wrong way. Like, as an industry, you're talking about yes, like, like, not individual. The customer. Films. Yeah is always going to find someone to do it cheaper. Mm-hmm. You cannot ever like have a conspiracy. And by the way, that's I think it's illegal, by the way, to have price fixing. Um, you can't have a conspiracy where you get every single person to agree to not do a wedding film for less than X dollars. There's always going to be a need for a lower cost option in any market. And so there's always going to be a place for there's always going to be s- someone who wants to buy a two thousand dollar both photo and video. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't it be better if that was your money? Yeah, yeah not because... maybe better if it was your time. Right. But if you had a bunch of people with integrity making that money mm-hmm. instead of a bunch of people with who are literally just guys who've never even shot a wedding before, but it run AdWords campaigns and or or wouldn't it be better? The, the quality of work would be better. Less couples would get screwed as well if those companies, those booking agencies, instead of being a booking agency where they're just hiring a bunch of contractors to edit in, you know, Indonesia and then a bunch of, you know, um, people on, on the ground to, to do the shooting in their local area. They're going on Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, whatever, to find these people. Instead of that, what if these booking agencies were actual studios that hired employees that 
gave their employees that long-term security. And a fair living wage. A fair living wage the way, where they would, could work till they're that's 60. What would actually, that's what we're talking about. That's what would actually raise the prices. Right. What would actually raise the prices is if the cost went up. And if people would evaluate their business based on cost instead of how much gross income they want to make. Like, mm-hmm. literally the way that wedding filmmakers operate their business is, like, the most rudimentary understanding of money possible. <laughs> I agree. It's like I made, oh, I'm averaging, like, just, like, quite literally when I'm, like, oh, wow. Like, when you say to someone, like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm charging $10,000 these days. Uh, what do you mean by that? I mean, one time I charged $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're like, that's not your, what you're charging. Yeah, What's yeah, your yeah. average sale? Yeah. Well, it was And also, it was a four-day wedding. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, and I, like I, I had to deliver 700 hours of film. <laughs> it's like, okay, like, it's not equal. Yes. Like, right? And so, like, they just, that's how they think about money, mm-hmm. right? It's all the vanity metrics and nothing else. And, a, like, an industry ran by wise people who is – any kind of like foresight and willingness to consider the implications of what it all means, they would be thinking about like, are we building an industry that allows us to retire? Mm -hmm. Like, like what are we doing here? And I know like for us, it's easy. And and I say this because I'm not saying this like, uh, you know, we don't have to talk about this. We could just keep doing what we're doing. Because we're making money off other people's ignorance. Mm-hmm. The fact that other people aren't running their business better is good for us. You know? And, and, and so, like, if anyone is hearing this, like, these guys sound so arrogant. It's like, eh, no, you don't get it. Like, I don't have to talk about this. It doesn't benefit me to tell everyone that their thinking is wrong. It would be much better for me to just keep capitalizing on everyone's bad thinking. Sure. Like, financially. Yeah. But but that's not what we want, you know. We want to help grow people and grow the industry. And so we don't have all the answers either. Yeah. So we're not coming. Well, and, and we're coming at it like if someone's like, oh, what is the benefit to, like, you guys telling us this? Like, you guys are just, you know, what is the benefit? I think the benefit is, is, like, I mean, probably either way, our business is probably going to be pretty good. But I think if we have a more mature industry, that means – the consumer has more confidence in our industry. That means more people book. That means higher rates for everybody. That's how you make a stronger industry and everyone gets paid more money. Everybody. Yes. Like that's how you actually raise all boats. And Well, you, it's one of those things where it's like – It's not just individuals charging more money because individual companies charging more money is a flash-in-the-pan philosophy. Like – an individual. What is who's the like, thirty-year earnings of every person in the industry? Is what we're talking about compared to like yes. like. So if someone's like, I I charge average of three thousand dollars a wedding film for yeah. three years. So you made what? How much money did you make? Oh, I made a two hundred and seventy k. Yeah, or whatever it is, you made three hundred k over three years, and then you flamed out, or you, or maybe you're slowly declined or something. Yeah. So maybe five hundred grand in the life of your career. I would much rather people make 1.8 million, 2 million in the life of their career. Right. Right. And that's how you need- have people. And, and I th- also think there's benefit to people being in an industry for 20, 30 years and not just moving around all over. Like you can move around companies, but staying in an industry and understanding the industry, understanding how wedding films are evolving. And, well, and even and then, being able to like put up a fight against wedding planners who are cheaping us out. Like, sure. Like and, the and, fact that there's always someone at the bottom willing, like I don't believe in undercutting really, but like if there was more standardization across the board, we would all, they would know, people who are buying this stuff would know that this is just how much it costs. Mm-hmm. And we would be confidently saying, well, I can't do that. I have employees. Yeah. I yeah. can't do that. It costs me too much money to make that instead of like, yeah. Well, I mean, okay, I want two thousand dollars, and right. you know that's better than zero dollars. Right. <laughs> it's like oh, the t- the truth is, uh, people are able to be sniped and, um, you know, undercut um, by even wedding planners to be like, well, I can't charge, I can't have you charge that much. My couple just won't get it. Will you do it for this? It's like if there were more people 
to having legit businesses that are just like, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, I can't do that. I can't do it. Like, th- that's like literally, it, I, I'm, it, I, I can't Then it just creates it. an expectation of what everyone else can assume. And, and honestly, I mean, guys, there's a reason why videographers charge less than photographers. It's because they are much more established in a much more mature industry than mm-hmm. we are. I think there's a lot more components to what we do. And traditionally, photography has been like the golden service for everyone. Um, I do think that's changing just by culture and the world. And I'm social talking media. to planners all the time now who are now acknowledging that what we do is harder. Yeah. And not understanding why it's cheaper. And they're also telling me photographers are out of control with their pricing. Yep. All so get time. ready because that part of it is changing. The understanding of of what we do is changing. So we need to shape up quick. And I think we have this window of opportunity before everything gets outsourced or be, before technology changes the industry and, and reshapes everything completely. Who knows what's in the future well, the, when it comes to that? The other side of it is like I in, – in relation is like we tried to hire editors for our outsourcing company, mm-hmm. right? I couldn't find anyone – who's willing to do it for the prices that you people who are want edits from us are willing to pay. Mm-hmm. So everyone wants good, ed- they, they're like everybody's like, there's nothing wrong with overseas editing, but everybody in, in the States wants a, a person in the States. That would be like the dream editor, right? They want a great editor who's good, who they don't have to explain. Like, they, they want themselves. Yeah. Which I and guess. they want to pay someone like themselves Two hundred dollars. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so you're like, that's a factor of the way that they set their business up. They don't know it, but it's like they're dead when they sold the contract. Mm-hmm. So, because if they were like, oh, I'm going to pay someone a thousand dollars an edit, so I'm raising my prices a thousand dollars because I want to pay for an editor yeah. instead of I'm raising my price a thousand dollars because I'm suddenly better and I want to make more money. Yep. That's how people think, and it's like that is what you guys have to change in your thinking. Yeah. It's like I'm going to raise my prices. To, to pay more cost. Yeah. Like I'm gonna pay for a better second shooter and I'm pay for a better yeah. editor. Because it, it doesn't necessarily make you more money to charge that extra to bring someone else on, but it makes your edits much faster, much more consistent, and it allows you to take on more work. And it allows you to build an so, industry or maybe right? you hire the person. Maybe maybe you are budgeting $1,000 a film and you end yep. up saying, oh, now I can shoot 40 weddings. Yep. Right or fifty, I'm 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 willing to go out and shoot fifty. I just don't want to edit them. Yeah. So you might turn your business from a two hundred thousand dollar gross business to like a four hundred thousand dollar business overnight. Yeah. Just by paying someone fifty grand to edit your films. Yep. And that thinking is so people don't do think that way at all, Jared. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. It's like like that's all I'm really addressing is not so much that there are these people out there willing to do the jobs. I just know like the mindset that the average wedding filmmaker has will make sure they're never those people Mm -hmm. and that they, most people will never be able to retire and the average person will end up at the end of their career destitute Yep. with no prospects. Yep. So don't do that. Or if they, you know, are successful, it won't be in the wedding industry. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Which that's okay. That's okay. And all of it's okay. Yeah. It's not for everyone. It's not for long term. But I think for a lot of people, the, the uncertainty of moving on to another industry um, could keep people up at night, yes. could, could be stressful. Like, and, and some people won't be as successful in their next job as they were as a wedding filmmaker. Or, or they didn't have the amount of freedom or, or the, the luxury that I think wedding filmmaking you know, brings a person. Someday so. we'll, we'll come up with a little class or something. We'll, we're, we've, we've always thought about like, how can we help people establish a studio We'd love to hear from you guys if that's like interesting or where yeah. your pain points on this. Give us a shout out because um, head over to Instagram or whatever, or DM us or something. Yeah. Because for us, it's always like, are people even interested? Like I've I, I've had people tell me in education, like, oh, we don't really want you to speak at this event about building teams or whatever. Yeah, they're like, they're like, well, you're more of like a volume guy, and I'm like, no, I'm not. Like I train wedding filmmakers, like to make wedding films and I did it successfully and I'm, I'm not like, just on our podcast, but for a studio and freaking real dozens life. Dozens of people. Like, yeah. Like yeah. I've trained more people than most anybody in the wedding industry. Yeah. So real people, not just people who went to my class for one day. Yeah. Like they are professional shooters. Yeah. And, and so like, I know firsthand, I remember we went to, there's this one guy at a conference. 
we went to a conference and he just kept roasting us in Facebook because he's like, oh, volume filmmakers, wedding factories, wedding mill. And I'm always like, dude, like, you don't get it. Yeah. You didn't even look at our work, by the way. But second of all, it's like, my point is, I know the stigma. Yeah. I know that when we say build a studio or anything about this, that there's an immediate like. <laughs> I remember that, dude. I wonder if he's even in the wedding industry anymore. <laughs> yeah, or it's just like, like the stigma that associated with not doing anything associated with your wedding filmmaking is negative. Yeah, totally. And that needs a change. Yep, yep. So, guys, I mean, this is a lot to take on. I, I think, again, this is probably... Now go implement all of this. Yeah, go do it now uh, in, in one swoop what did we even talk about it was like the most unfocused podcast yeah but I, I i think it's unfocused because again there's no structure i i haven't heard planners talk about this photographers talk about this anyone in our industry talk about retirement well whatsoever. i've tried to even think about how to talk about it it's such a challenging subject because the answers are multi they're like generational answers they sure. just, it's like a 20-year problem yeah yep yep and and there's a lot of uncertainty into the future. There's a lot of um, just trying to figure out where we are as an industry right now, but also trying to project like where we'll be in 10 years. Like, because again, like all of this could be totally uprooted by just something as new as like kids technology. just walking around with their phones and just shooting yeah. t- a t- TikTok of a wedding and leaving. Or a Star Wars droid or something. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, whatever it is, like, Technology is always, you know, changing. The last thing I would want to say is like, we're irreplaceable, like, uh, because truck drivers are about to be obsolete, like, been replaced. So it's like, who knows? But who knows? Anyways, um, things I would to think, think we're, about. I think we are probably ascending. Uh, by the way, um, yeah, I think so. I, just based on numbers and and conversations that we have. Um, so I, hopefully, this is just like forces you to think about some things. Hopefully, it gives you some hope um, and some options. Uh, to maybe uh, think about, talk to your family about, and just try to figure out, like, we're at a stage right now for where most of us are kind of dipping down into our off season, unless you're in Florida or somewhere like crazy hot where it's actually opposite wedding season. Um, But for all of us, I think it's always good. And the new year, I always like to look at our business as a whole and be like, where are we going? Like, how, where are we going to be in five years, 10 years, whatever? Um, and not even necessarily get it down on paper, but just be thinking through problems like mm-hmm. uh, of the future. So um, hopefully this has been uh, inspiring to you. Um, like any podcast, I think we really want to just raise questions that people haven't thought about a whole lot uh, to make them think about it and apply it to their own business. So hopefully that uh, was the case. Uh, Jay, where can people find us? What, what do you want people to do through Wedding <sighs> Film School right now? I want you, if this is what I'll say. If you listen to this and you were like, I want to talk about this with someone, um, go sign up for a coaching session. It's This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have, if you we, want to talk to someone. And they're, you know, I, I don't think they're, they're not cheap, right? Because my time is valuable. Yeah. And Jared's time is valuable. And we don't really want to be talking to people who d- don't value me at the time I can make money on something else. So that being said, I, I will I will say like investing in yourself is valuable. Yeah. So if you're listening to this and you've heard me talk about it and this is the subject that like triggers your mind, I would encourage you to do that. Like, you know, and sign up and we can talk and say like, how are you set up? Yeah. You have coaching sessions on the website that people can. Yeah. Weddingfilm.school right school and you can do a coaching, but also get a financial advisor. Like go go get someone to help you set up, you know, at least get a Roth IRA if you're in America or like start doing something about it. Yeah. You know, whether it be raising your prices or getting an associate, like write down the options for you that you're like, okay, this would be interesting to me. Like I want to move into commercial or I would love to build teams or I would love to just get to a certain price point that I can retire and just, you know, freaking be... Jack Dorsey in Indonesia. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you want to be doing, like put it down and like get it out of your brain and make it a real thing and either talk about it with someone or just start acting on it. Don't just think like, you know, like I, I have this one bill at home that it's a dumb bill. It's not even a lot of money, but I, and I, like for like a, two weeks, I'm just like, I don't want to open that bill. 
just want to look at it. It's just, it's just like, I don't know why. It's just like an obligation. I don't want to think about it. It's a problem. It's like, and I'll probably forget about it. It was like a stupid, like, I had to update my credit card for my easy pass mm -hmm. for the tolls. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just didn't. I kept putting it off, and then I got like a fine on it, and I was like, ah, darn it. Yeah. You know, it's like, don't do that. Don't procrastinate this. Put some action into it now before you really have to deal with the actual pain. Right. Like, right. live in the pain today. Yep. Like, before it's the real pain. Sure, sure. Yeah, just uh, approaching your problems and actually knocking them out. Um, guys, I would say, um, if you haven't, check us out on Facebook and YouTube, Wedding Film School. Also, we have a YouTube just specifically for this show called The Wedding Film School Show. If you want to uh, see us talk. If you want to see us talk. Our studio is pretty cool. And then also on Instagram, The Wedding Film School Show. That's where you can find us over there. Uh, anyhow, hopefully this has been an interesting conversation to you. Have a great week, guys, and we'll see you next time right here on The Wedding Film School Show.